Hello everyone! This video is entitled Electromagnetic Radiation. In this video, I'll explain why light particles, or photons, are referred to as electromagnetic radiation. I'll be discussing their wave-like behavior and how it's associated with their electric and magnetic fields. I will also describe the many properties of photons, including wavelength, frequency, and amplitude, and make clear how these particles transfer energy. Finally, I'll explain how the spectroscopy methods of emission and absorption spectra work, how they can be used to identify elements, and why they are related to the concept of a quantum and the study of quantum mechanics. Okay, let's get started. Electromagnetic radiation is formally defined as a form of energy emitted and absorbed by light particles called photons, which exhibit wave-like behavior as they travel through space. Now, that's a complicated definition. Basically, electromagnetic radiation is light. It's the same light you might see in a rainbow. However, radio waves and X-rays and gamma rays are also forms of electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation is an incredibly important means of transferring energy. As we know, there are two ways energy can move from one place to another. The first is to transfer energy using a particle or an object. A good example of this would be the collision of a ball thrown at a door, causing it to swing open. The second is the transfer of energy through the use of waves, such as the ripples caused by a stone thrown into water. But what's amazing about electromagnetic radiation is that it exhibits both wave and particle properties at the same time. To fully understand this, you must first know that light energy travels in discrete particles, called photons. Now, even though a photon is considered neutral, meaning it does not have a charge, it acquires an electric field from its energetic source of origin. A photon is referred to as electromagnetic radiation simply because it carries an electric field that generates a magnetic field as it moves. It is the constant oscillation of its electric field above and below the photon as it moves through space that generates its magnetic field. What's more is the constant moving of the photon's magnetic field in turn generates its electric field thereby forming a continuous, self-perpetuating electromagnetic wave. Hence, the name electromagnetic radiation. To clarify, a photon is not a charged particle, but as it moves through space, its electric field, which points up at one moment and down the next, generates a magnetic field, giving the particle of light its wave character. A good analogy is to imagine that you are sitting in the passenger seat of a car on a highway. As you stretch your arm out the window and move it up and down while the car is traveling, your arm, the electric field, creates a wave as the car, the photon, moves along the highway. This graphic shows a photon being shot out of a laser. You can see the electric field oscillating above and below the photon as it moves. Because of those oscillations, light is also generating a wave, shown here as a trace of the oscillating electric field. Okay, so the next thing we're going to cover is the speed of light. So the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen that before, uh, but what can be very confusing for a lot of students is the association of energy with speed. Now I know photons are very, very high in energy, but every photon is actually traveling at the exact same speed. So let me show you guys where this can get confusing. If a car is traveling down the road at 20 kilometers an hour and it collides with the wall, that collision may cause some damage but the damage caused by that collision will be far less than if the car were traveling at 120 kilometers an hour. The reason being is because the car going faster will have far more energy. Same thing with a baseball player throwing a baseball. If someone throws a baseball at me at 45 miles an hour, 
that's going to hurt a lot. But it definitely won't hurt as much as if that same ball were thrown at 95 miles an hour. So in everyday life, we associate the speed of an object with the energy that object may have. But with photons, you can't do that same association because all photons in the electromagnetic spectrum are moving at the exact same speed, 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. So how exactly can we differentiate between one photon's amount of energy and another photon's amount of energy? Well, what we have to do is we have to look at the wave. So waves are differentiated between one another with the use of wavelengths and wave frequencies. If you look at the bottom of the slide here, you can see a photon moving for red light and a photon moving for blue light. So the blue light is actually much higher in energy than the red light. And the reason I know that and the reason you can see that here is because of the amount of waves that are created as that photon is moving. So again, the red photon and the blue photon are moving at the exact same speed. However, as the blue photon is moving, it's creating far more waves than the red photon. That's essentially frequency, and because of its very high frequency, it has low wavelengths. If you don't understand what that means, in the slides to come, I'm definitely going to give you a formal understanding of wavelength and frequency. Before we do that, let me jump to the image on slide 6 to clarify exactly what we're talking about here. So. This image here shows you the difference in wavelengths from radio waves all the way to gamma rays. So let's just look at the two extremes. So look at radio waves. You have very loose, large waves there. In fact, they're so large that those waves actually span the distance between buildings, as you can see from that scale. But gamma rays, gamma rays are very tight, repetitive waves. They're very, very short wavelengths, meaning the distance from one wave to the other is very small, so small that it actually spans the distance from one side of an atomic nuclei to the other. So to give you guys a better understanding of the amount of energy in these waves, look at the bottom scale. That bottom scale tells you how much energy is required to make those waves. So radio waves are actually created at a temperature below negative 272 degrees Celsius. That's an incredibly cold temperature to be creating that wavelength. But if you look at gamma rays, you need a temperature well above 10 million degrees Celsius to create a gamma ray. So if I'm hit with a gamma ray, I'm not going to turn into the Hulk. That will wipe me out. That's definitely going to be a fatal exposure to energy. Whereas radio waves are actually exposed to radio waves all the time. Your phone exposes you to radio waves. Um, you turn on the radio, that's because there's radio waves around you. So you're actually bombarded by those radio waves all the time. Now, you can see all the different components of electromagnetic uh, radiation here. Microwaves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-rays. Those are the major components of the entire electromagnetic uh, spectrum. And so we're going to delve into that a little bit more as we go. Okay, so let's jump to the next slide where we can describe wavelengths and frequencies a little bit better. Okay, so let's formally define wavelength and frequency. Let's start with wavelength. A wavelength is the distance between successive crests in a continuous wave. So a crest is the highest point in a wave, and a trough is the lowest point. A wavelength is the distance from the crest of one wave to the crest of the adjacent wave. So basically, it is the distance of one waveform. Okay? Now, the symbol for a wavelength is the Greek letter lambda. A wavelength is measured in nanometers. So that's a billionth the size of a meter. It's 10 to the power of negative 9, which brings us to frequency symbolized by the Greek letter nu. So frequency is the number of cycles or waves that pass a point in one second. Okay, And frequency is measured in hertz. So if you look at the bottom right image, um, wave A, you can see, has essentially one waveform or one wavelength in one second 
which is why it's associated with 1 hertz. If you look at wave B, in one second you have what looks like two wave lengths, which is why you have 2 hertz. Okay? A higher frequency exhibits more cycles past a particular point per second. Again, that's why you have more energy. So how is wavelength and frequency related? Wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional. What that means is if I have a higher frequency, I'm going to have a shorter wavelength or vice versa. A higher frequency wave has more energy than a low frequency wave. An example of this would be x-rays. So x-rays are much higher in frequency than say a radio wave or a microwave. And because they're higher in frequency, we shouldn't expose ourselves to too many x-rays over the course of our lives because it could be very harmful to us. Again, because they're higher in energy. The speed of light in a vacuum can be derived from the following formula. So again, C is the speed of light, and that's constant, never changes. It's always 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. But what does change is frequency and wavelength. Frequency here, symbolized by the Greek letter nu, and wavelength, symbolized by uh, the Greek letter lambda. And so the formula is basically C is equal to nu times lambda, or frequency times wavelength. And because they're inversely proportional, if one number is large, the other one is small, when you multiply them together, you essentially always get the same answer, the speed of light. Okay, so this brings us to amplitude. What is amplitude? The amplitude, or height of a wave, represents its intensity. A wave with a higher amplitude has a greater intensity, is brighter than a wave with a lower amplitude. So again, if you look at the image on the right there, you have two separate waves. You have the smaller wave and you have the larger wave. Now, the smaller wave and the larger wave actually have the same frequency and they have the same wavelength. The only difference is that the larger wave has a higher pitch to the crest. So it's essentially just a, a taller wave, okay? Or it has a lower trough, okay? So uh, to break this down for you, let's say I have red light. I could have a red photon that appears dimmer to me, or I can have a red photon that appears brighter to me. The same color photon or the same color of red, it's just a dimmer or brighter version of that same photon. Again, they're moving with the same wavelength and the same frequency and the same speed, but because the amplitude is higher on one of those photons, it appears brighter. The source, okay? So what is the source of electromagnetic radiation? In our solar system, the source of electromagnetic radiation is of course the sun. Uh, it is a star just like any other. Uh, and it is, it is, of course, the dominant uh, producer of electromagnetic radiation for Earth. Now, the sun is capable of producing a continuous amount of electromagnetic radiation due to nuclear fusion of hydrogen nuclei into helium. Okay. Now, the temperature. This is really important. Um, the temperature required to make a full spectrum of electromagnetic radiation is something to the tune of approximately 15.7 million degrees, okay? And so that's giving us almost the entirety of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, so back to slide six. This is just to show you the definition of electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, so an electromagnetic spectrum is the range. That's what the word spectrum means. It's the range of all possible frequencies and wavelengths for electromagnetic radiation. So what then is the visible spectrum? The visible spectrum is the portion of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum that is visible to us. It's what we can see with the human eye. Okay, and so the wavelength 
for that spectrum is 390 to 700 nanometers, okay? That's separate and different from a continuous spectrum. A continuous spectrum is produced when white light passes through a prism, causing the components or colors to disperse, okay? So you can see here, white light is entering a prism. And so white light is a mixture of all the colors of the visible spectrum, okay? And that white light is being spread out by the spectrum into what looks like a rainbow. All the different components or all the different color components or wavelengths and frequencies of that light. So all the wavelengths of light are represented as an uninterrupted sequence, a rainbow. Everything we've talked about so far has brought us to this portion of the lecture. Here, I'm going to start to describe to you how we use electromagnetic radiation to identify different types of compounds and elements. It all kind of boils down to how a specific type of material absorbs energy and releases energy. If I hit a specific element with a certain amount of energy or light, it will absorb it differently from a different element and it will release that energy that it absorbed differently than another element. And so that's where we're gonna go into right now when it comes to spectroscopy and the explanation of emission spectrums and absorption spectrums. So let's start with emission spectrums or line spectrum. The emission spectrum of a chemical element or chemical compound is the spectrum of frequencies of electromagnetic radiation emitted due to an atom's electrons making a transition from high energy state to low energy state. I know that sounds very confusing uh, to you. It's probably just a bunch of words. So let me show you what this means uh, with this little pop up here. OK, so this image has two Bohr Rutherford diagrams in them. The one at the top is essentially showing an electron being hit with a certain amount of energy. And that energy is going to be absorbed by that electron and it's going to jump from the first orbital ring to the second orbital ring. OK, in the diagram below it, that same electron that absorbed the energy is now releasing that energy. And as it releases the energy, it falls from the high energy state now to a low energy state. We call the low energy state ground state and we call the high energy state an excited state. So in the diagram at the top, a ground state electron absorbs energy and jumps to an excited state. In the diagram in the bottom, you have an excited state electron releasing energy and it falls down back to its ground state. Okay, let's go back to the slide. Before we go any further, it's important to note that the energy an electron is releasing when it falls from excited state back down to its ground state is in the form of light. It's a photon. What's more is the photons that these electrons are releasing when they fall from excited state to ground state are within the visible spectrum. They, are, they have frequencies that we can see. So an emission spectrum consists of distinct colored lines that are discontinuous, i.e. it's not a rainbow. So if you look at the bottom here, we have the emission spectrum for hydrogen. So you see all these distinct colored lines. Each one of those colored lines represents a photon that was released from a particular electron. The reason why you have so many different colored lines and they're different um, specific colors is because each electron can jump different amounts of energy levels. So if I have an electron that jumps three energy levels, it's gonna release a photon with more energy than an electron that jumped one energy level. And the different colors represents the specific energies of each one of those electrons. Okay, so let me clarify this. Let me, let's jump to another um, pop-up here, okay? This is the visible spectrum, okay? Now I want you to note on the left side of this picture, you see that it says radio waves at the top and gamma rays at the bottom, which means that 
the energy increases going down, okay? Now, you can see that there's a 700 um, nanometer wavelength for red and a 400 nanometer wavelength for blue, okay? Remember, the larger the number, the lower the energy, because the larger the number, that means that you have a larger wavelength, which means you have a lower frequency, which means you have a lower energy. If you have a smaller wavelength, like blue here, that means that you have a smaller wavelength, but a higher frequency, which means you have higher energy. And that's why it's going down towards the gamma, okay? So if I have, for instance, an electron that jumped many energy levels, I might see a colored line in the blue spectrum or maybe even the purple spectrum, which actually comes right after blue. You don't see it here, but it comes right after blue. If I have a lower energy jump, so let's say it's just two or three energy levels, I might see something in the middle, maybe with the turquoise or the green or the yellow. But if I have a very low energy jump, so I have an electron that only jumped one energy level, okay, I might see a, a, a colored line in the red spectrum or maybe in the orange spectrum, depending on the element. So let's go back to the slide. Now, some of you guys might be looking at the hydrogen emission spectrum with a little bit of confusion. You might be wondering, how is it possible that the hydrogen emission spectrum has five distinct colored lines, each line representing the specific amount of energy that an electron released when it fell from excited state to ground state, but hydrogen only has one electron. The reason why this happens is because when we do experiments, we're not doing ex experiments on one specific hydrogen atom. No, we're doing it on a cloud of hydrogen. So let's, let's say I shoot a cloud of hydrogen with energy. One atom of hydrogen might absorb a certain amount of energy that causes its electron to jump one energy level. When that electron jumps from its ground state up one energy level, as it falls, it's going to release a photon within the red spectrum. So you can see that red line there. Whereas another hydrogen atom might absorb much more energy and it might cause that electron to jump quite a few energy levels, let's say four energy levels. When that electron falls from its excited state, it's gonna release a photon within the violet range. So you can see those violet ranges there. Maybe four energy levels represents um, one, one of those lines and three energy levels represents a different one of those lines, maybe the blue or the turquoise. And the special thing about hydrogen is each one of those hydrogen atoms can only get excited to a specific point. So specifically to those, those lines, you're not going to see lines outside of those five, which is why we look at these spectrums as fingerprints for elements. This image here has four Bohr-Rutherford diagrams. Each one of them is showing an electron falling from a specific energy level down to its ground state. And each of those falls represents a different amount of energy that's being released and hence a different color. So if you look at the one on the far left, the violet there, you can see an electron is falling four energy levels from energy level six back down to energy level two. And that energy drop is releasing that nice purple color. If you look all the way to the right, the red color, you can see that an electron is only falling one energy level from three to two. And that's why the photon is in the lower color spectrum. It's in the red spectrum. And of course you have the middle colors, uh, blue and green, because of the variance in their fall. So five to two um, and respectively, four to two. Okay, let's go back to the slide. Different types of matter emit unique line spectra. So like I said before, the hydrogen emission spectra you see at the bottom here is actually used as a fingerprint for hydrogen. It's used in, as an identifier. Uh, and the reason why that is is because hydrogen is the only element that will create those specific colors in those specific regions on a detector. So a different element, for instance, will create specific colors of its, of its own in specific areas on a detector, and that allows us to identify that matter as what it is. 
So we use these spectra to identify differences in matter. We use it to identify matter. These spectrums provide information about the arrangement of electrons in an atom. So we're not going to focus too much on that topic in this package, but it becomes critical for our understanding of the packages to come. So you have to understand, ultimately, we're moving towards the arrangement of electrons. We're moving towards the understanding of how electrons are arranged in an atom and how we get to that understanding from spectra. So you need to fully grasp this topic to grasp the topics that are coming. Again, I'm using this information to scaffold to the ideas that we ultimately need to reach. So that second point becomes very important in the future. Now, the points that are coming um, in the in the slide um, are essentially review points of what we've already discussed. So it's nothing new, just a review, a refresher of what we just finished discussing. So emission bright line spectra. So it's oftentimes referred to as a bright line spectra because you can see that on the black detector at the bottom here, you can see that there's bright colored lines. And so the emission line spectra, also known as the emission bright line spectra or the bright line spectrum, okay? This type of spectrum can uh, be produced when high voltage is applied to a gas. Uh, and so I, there's a diagram on the slide to come. We'll get to that and I'll fully walk you through that. The electrons in the gas atoms will absorb the energy, okay? And the electrons, when they absorb this, these energies and get to a high excited state, they then fall to a lower uh, energy state or their ground state. And when they do that, they emit particular frequencies of light that will hit a detector on the opposite side and create these bright line um, spectrums. The energy or radiation released appears as bright lines on the spectrum. Uh, different gases will emit different frequencies of light when energized, okay? So let's jump to that diagram. And here it is. So I'm going to draw your attention to the center of this diagram, the gas discharge tube containing hydrogen. So I'm just going to highlight that for you right there. Okay. So in this tube, we have hydrogen. And what we're doing at either end of the tube is we're, we're basically just pumping really high voltage energy into the tube. What that energy is doing is it's, it's exciting the electrons in the hydrogen atoms and causing them to jump from low energy state to high energy state. When those electrons fall from the excited state to ground state, they're releasing their photons, their, their colored beams. But because all of those colored beams are being released at the same time, we, with our human eyes, cannot differentiate between the different colors. To us, it comes out as one just white beam of light. And so we take that beam of light and we filter it by passing it through these slits to create really just a funneled beam to pass through a prism. That beam is passed through a prism and the prism splits it into the various different colors of that specific element. In this case, it'd be hydrogen. And so those colors hit a detector and we get our spectrum, okay? And so that's how we essentially create these emission spectrum or bright line spectrums for elements. Now, if the element can't be gaseous at, at room temperature, uh, what we do is we actually burn that element. So it is possible. All you really have to do is add a lot of energy to an element and cause it to emit light. Okay. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the absorption dark line spectrum. It's actually the exact opposite of the bright line spectrum where the emission spectra, we're essentially measuring the light that is released by excited electrons. In the absorption spectra, what we're doing is we're measuring the energy that is absorbed by ground state electrons to get to the excited state. So if that doesn't make any sense, it will be clarified in the diagram in the next slide. So let me just walk you through this really quick. Um, this type of spectra is produced when white light is passed through a gas. The gas will absorb specific frequencies of light and allow the remainder of the light to hit a detector on the opposing side. The electrons in the gas atoms are excited from lower energy state to higher energy state. 
The energy radiation absorbed appears as dark lines in the absorption spectra produced. So different gases will absorb different frequencies of light. This provides each element with an atomic fingerprint. So if you look here, this is also hydrogen, okay? But at the bottom here, what you're seeing is the absorption spectrum of hydrogen. Notice that the lines are identical in placement as the lines in the absorption spectra. What you're doing now is you're allowing the light to pass through the element, and that element, as it's absorbing the, the photons that it requires to jump to excited state, it's leaving those dark lines. So let's go to the next slide to see what this looks like. So this diagram here clearly shows how we accomplish these absorption spectrums. And so the canister of gas is going to be highlighted right here, okay? Now, it's important to note that this canister of gas is cooled. The reason why we cool the gas before we run the experiment is because cooler gas is far more effective at absorbing energy than, of course, energized gas. And so we cool the gas before we pass white light through it. This is a continuous spectrum that we're passing through the gas. It is a spectrum that has the full rainbow. It is pure white light. And it's coming from a source that's producing that white light. It passes through the cool gas. And of course, the cool gas is going to absorb specific fragments of that white light. So specific photons from the white light will be absorbed by the electrons in this cool gas. And those electrons will jump from ground state to excited state. As they're jumping from ground state to excited state, the remainder of the light passes through the gas, through a slit, and hits a prism, okay? And the prism is going to split the remainder of the light that passes through that gas to a detector. On the detector, you'll see these distinct dark black lines. And those black lines represent the photons that were absorbed by the cool gas for its electrons to jump from ground state to excited state. And so if you look at the absorption spectrum of hydrogen and the emission spectrum of hydrogen, both of them have lines in the exact same regions. And the reason why this is is because in the emission spectrum, you saw that those electrons, when they fell from excited state to ground state, they emitted these distinct colored lines. But in the absorption spectrum, what we tried to accomplish here is we wanted those electrons to absorb those specific colors and we wanted the rest of the light to pass through, which gave us these dark lines. Okay, And so that's why we can use these spectrums as fingerprints or as identifiers for specific elements. What's important to note is that for absorption spectrum, it's very difficult to do an absorption spectrum for elements that do not exist in gaseous state or cannot be kept in gaseous state under pressurized conditions. The reason why is because we need to pass light through them, okay? And so our main identifier really is the emission spectrum of uh, many of these elements, okay? And this whole process, this whole analytical method is called spectroscopy. It's important to know that this whole concept, everything we've talked about so far in this lecture, is spectroscopy. That's the method that we're using here. That's the analytical method, okay? And so this finally brings us to our last concept of uh, this lecture, the quantum. In 1900, uh, a physicist named Max Planck, he's a very famous physicist, uh, suggested that matter at the atomic level can absorb or emit um, only discrete quantities of energy. And you can see that with hydrogen. So hydrogen can only absorb and can only release specific amounts of energy, hence the specific lines on uh, its spectrums, okay? Each of these specific quantities are called quantums of energy. So if you look again at the hydrogen absorption spectrum, okay, each one of those black lines is a quantum of energy. It's a specific quantity of energy hence quantum, okay? Each one of those lines represents a photon that, that has a specific amount of energy, a specific quantum of energy, and that quantum of energy is absorbed by the electron, which causes it to jump, leaving that black line. 
Each quantum of energy carried by a light particle called a photon discovered by Einstein. Albert Einstein was the man who discovered uh, photons and he was the one who named them. So, in other words, Planck said that the energy of an atom can be quantized. And the reason why this, this is true is because each element absorbs specific quantums of energy. Now, it doesn't absorb one specific quantum of energy, it absorbs quantums of energy. So look at, look at hydrogen again. The hydrogen absorption spectrum, it absorbs five different quantums of energy because each particle of light is a quantum of energy. Do you understand? And so if one particle of light is absorbed, that's one quantum of energy. But each one of those quantums of energy leaves a, a specific black line. And so it brings us to our pinnacle uh, definition here, okay? Quantum mechanics. What is quantum mechanics? Quantum mechanics is the study of the interaction of energy and matter at the atomic level. So it's a very, 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 very fancy uh, branch of science, uh, but its base definition is pretty simplistic. It is simply the study of the interaction of energy and matter at the atomic level. Trust me when I say it gets far more complicated than that, uh, but for the, the purposes of this course, that's really all we need to know. That's all we need to understand. We need to understand the interplay, the, the interaction of energy and matter at an atomic level. And that'll be the focus for the, the coming lectures and the coming slides uh, that you will be presented with. I hope uh, you understood this package and all the best.